in 2017, we all know what happened there with the Astros. That's the one that you know causes him still the most sort of frustration. First time on this show, I heard him on Dodgers territory the other day. The Athletics, Andy McCullough joining us right now. You can also listen to his podcast, The Roundtable. But that's old news right now, Andy. Great to see you. We're all about the book right now. The last of his kind, a biography, uh, the first of its kind, as far as I know, on Clayton Kershaw. And there's a lot of Clayton in there, which I want to dive into because he is a tough cookie with interviews sometimes. It is out yesterday. So you can get it wherever you get your books. Andy, I listen to way too much of your content. I'm going to go against you as I say hello, okay? You said you can get it wherever you buy books. Don't get it on the secondary market. Get it on the first market. That's the only place where you can't get it. Is that fair? Yeah, I don't. I, I think actually people should just call the library and tell them that they want to read the book. Make the government pay for it. I like that idea. That's a good idea. Yeah. Let's put that in the library. All right, so let's get right into it, okay? Um, this this book will join the uh, the famous books that we have on the desk right well, now. Is he going to send us one? Because I have we, this we one will that was get sent one. to me. I have this one that was sent no, to me. No, I have a rule. I have this one that was sent to me. I have a Scott's rule. Scott's never even opened them. I've read them. That's not true. Scott bought them. All right, we're gonna let Andy. <laughs> we're gonna let Andy talk. My rule is that I I buy the books. We don't need a free book. I want a Andy, free book. Andy pours his life into this. So Andy, how are you gonna wow these uh, studious catchers into reading this book? Give give me it's, like if someone says, hey, you got you got thirty seconds. Sell me. What do you got? It would be almost as good as Kratzy's book if he didn't have that hack Tim Brown writing it. How about that? Ooh-wee! Ooh-wee! That's fine. I love smoke. Where there's fire, no. there's smoke. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, you guys know, like, Kershaw is a historically great player. And, you know, I was able to get uh, – spend a lot of time with him over the past couple of years to talk about, you know, his career. But also was able to, you know, talk about him – about to him about his future, about how long he wants to keep playing, you know, kind of the decisions he made this winter. And so I think it's kind of like an immersive portrait of, you know, a player who a lot of folks believe is the best pitcher of this generation. Certainly, you know, one of the best three, we can, you can debate that, you know, with him and Verlander and Scherzer for a while, obviously. Um, But yeah, and I think for Dodgers fans, it's the definitive account of his time, you know, as the face of the franchise. And I think it would really appeal to, you know, the millions of people in Southern California who can buy books. What surprised you about all the time that you spent with Clayton doing this and researching? What surprised you the most about him as a person? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, I think, you know, you, you have a sense when you're as a beat writer, you know, who people are, um, you know, but their conversations are a lot more short. They're a lot more targeted. They're a lot less open-ended. And so um, I, he is, I always knew him to be a bright guy, but he is way more sort of perceptive and um, just sort of aware of stuff going on, I think, than, you know, I, I sort of previously understood. And so it's the sort of thing like, you know, he can watch a pitcher from the other team pitch and within three or four pitches sort of pick up. is like, oh, is he doing something different? with his changeup this year you know he just is he's so sort of uh like he's able to take in information and figure stuff out you know so quickly and so i just came away like more impressed about that um with just yeah like his, his understanding of like the ecosystem of the clubhouse and, and and all that sort of stuff i was uh i i i you know i don't know it's like making it making it sound like i thought he was like a dumb guy i didn't think that but i was just more taken aback i was like oh yeah you knew about that that happened he's like yeah i know i pay attention to stuff that's going on he's just so sort of uh controlled and guarded I think that you know he doesn't uh he keeps a lot of things close to the vest I guess how much time do you actually get to spend with him that's I always I always wondered I've yeah. seen guys write books you know it took Kratz five minutes with Tim Brown to write his book <laughs> I'm sure you got longer than five minutes so explain explain what this process is like because you don't see a lot of Clayton Kershaw opening up like this so what was the yeah. you know the timeline for this and how much time did you did you like go to his house and he cooked you breakfast no, he did not cook me breakfast, although I did get an excellent uh, recipe for chicken and rice that his wife Ellen passed along that I have made. It's very good. Um, how, so I approached him in May of 2022 and kind of explained the project. Um, you know, he was open to doing it. Uh, there wasn't a lot of like negotiation and stuff like that. You know, he was good with uh, spending some time and talking for it. And so we uh, met up in the winter of 2022 in Dallas. I spent, you know, uh, some time at his house, you know, at his uh, his charity's office and, um, you know, 
uh, tended to them working out and things like that. I went to a Skechers commercial shoot with him, which was very fun. Um, and then subsequently during the season in 2023, I you know visited him in LA and spent a little time at the house there during the World Series. It just so happened that the team, you know, it was in Texas, and so I was able to visit him uh, at his house again there. And so there was probably like. I would say 10 like longer sit downs that, you know, of maybe somewhere from like 20 to 20 minutes to two hours over the course. I didn't, I actually haven't toted it all up, but um, I, yeah, there was about 10 sort of times where we sat down and, and talked for it. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, Andy, did you ask him why he is the way he is? Like you mentioned being guarded, like why is he guarded and, and does he, feel media fatigue. I don't know. You know, like sometimes you're around him and he's just like, ah, oh, I got to do the whole media thing again. Cause he's been in LA for a long time. Yeah. I think he, by nature is a, a guarded person. He has a really tight circle of friends I and mean, he's still friends with the same dudes he went to high school with, you know, 20 years ago. Um, I think that he, the media fatigue aspect of it, it's, it's interesting. Like he builds into his schedule um, every day when the days when he's not pitching, like a four or five minute window where he is at his locker and he's available to talk to the media. And he doesn't do that because he loves interacting with us, but he does that because he understands that that is part of the responsibility of being Clayton, Clayton Kershaw, especially, you know, in previous years when he wasn't sort of rehabbing and stuff like that, that he needed to be available. And so he tries to handle those interactions basically as efficiently and politely as possible. Um, you know, it's not dissimilar to like Derek Jeter, who, um, you know, everyone always said, oh, Derek Jeter never says anything. No, but he like talked all the time, you know, <laughs> and so he developed that almost as like a defense mechanism. And so um, one of the, you know, the, the great things about getting to do this is like getting outside of that environment where, you're, you know, he doesn't have somewhere better to be. I'm not bothering him at work. You know, that's one of the, the weird things about like the baseball media ecosystem is like players are in general, overwhelmingly professional and available and good to talk. But it's also like they got to go. They got stuff to do. They got to hit. They got to go to meetings. And so you're kind of catching people at these weird times where you're not they're not always able to you know, think about stuff as deeply as maybe they would like to. And so this book, I think, presents him outside of that context and is richer for it. Makes sense. Listen, I love Clayton. He's one of the all time greats. He's a great competitor. He, he's he's just he's a stud. That's it. Uh, but here, here's my question for you. There, there was times, you know, for years now he's been great. But there were times where he battled things like, you know, he's fallen off. You know, where it happened to Kershaw. Mm -hmm. He was so great, right? And one of the things we that I always heard was how stubborn he was. And he's like, yeah. I'm going to make this work with the pitches I throw. And I know the Dodgers went to him and said, hey, you need to throw a way to righties more to set up the in and mm -hmm. set up the slider in. And he, he basically refused to do it for a while. And then yeah. when he got back to being great, he's like, all right, I'm going to try it. And it worked. So is he like that in real life, too? Just like super stubborn, stuck in his ways and like, I'm going to make this happen? I think it's 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 an interesting paradox, right? Not paradox, but it's just a, it's a tough situation because when you're as good as he was for so long, right, why would you change? And so, for example, like the Dodgers approached him in the beginning of 2015 when uh, Andrew Friedman and Farhan Zaidi uh, took over and they suggested he throw his curveball more. And he was like, no, like that's not going to happen. He had just won the MVP. Like there was no reason for him to stop doing what he was doing. And so AJ Ellis described him as a, a late listener, which I thought was really good. It's someone he hears everything you say. And he, it's not that he disregards it. It's more that he doesn't implement it until it becomes necessary. And so I think that kind of the renaissance he's had, you know, after 2019, which when he's been healthy, he's been really effective. It's related to his openness to these new concepts, you know, his willingness to go to driveline to learn some stuff that, you know, five years earlier, it would have been like impossible to imagine him, you know, going there and throwing weighted balls. It's his willingness to, you know, change up some of his sequences to, you know, to try and throw more, you know, first pitch breaking balls to, as you said, like work away more to set up, you know, things like that. And so it's, it's the sort of thing that he didn't change until he had to, in part, because when you're that good, why would you stop doing what you're doing? Andy, when right. did you decide to write this book? And were you following the Dodgers, you know, off season and kind of going, oh, nice. OK, because they're they're. I mean, you covered them for a while. They're probably more popular than they've ever been, at least over the last few decades and internationally for sure. So seems like good timing for a Dodgers book on one of their legends. 
Yes, bringing back Kike Hernandez was great for their international business, and uh, you know I think that they're they're going to blow up. Um, I meant I saw Kike the other day, and he was like, "What are you going to do for your next book?" And I said, "I'll write about you." And he says, "You don't do comedy." And I was like, oh, "That's pretty good." Uh, bless his heart. Anyway, yeah, I mean, I think that it was one of the uh, one of the aspects you know that made this book really interesting is you know I'd started it a couple years earlier, and then. Uh, was kind of finishing it up this past winter as they are going after, you know, Otani and Yamamoto and, you know, having this billion dollar off season. And, oh, by the way, they still haven't made a decision on Kershaw, you know, and he was fairly open about, you know, he was more interested in going to Texas, I think, than um, he had been in previous years and ended up, you know, where it didn't work out, where he came back to the Dodgers and, you know, it sort of a, a, ends on like a, you know, a really uh, you kind of put a bow on it and it works, you know, the Dodgers fans are thrilled, you know, he's happy to be back with like this team that's, um, you know, a super team yet again. And if he can come back healthy, you know, the next couple of months, he'll be geared up, you know, to, to pitch in the postseason. And so, yeah, it definitely made the process of like finishing the book a little more exciting than I had expected it to be, but uh, I think it's worth it overall. Tim Brown just texted me because he's listening to the show and he said that it's a shame you didn't come out with your book sooner because he gave up reading just recently. So <laughs> I guess he'll never I guess he'll never read it. Yeah, no, Tim is uh, Tim is a very he's a he's a wonderful man. And uh, I, I owe a lot in my career to him. And uh, I hope he can't hear this because his hearing went out because he's so old. Yes. Yes, he is definitely <laughs> too old and too jacked to be able <laughs> yeah, to right? listen to what you say. He's super fit. <laughs> Super yeah. fit. Um, no, but my question is, in the book, how much did you talk about the elephant in the room? Playoff Kershaw. How much was that like, did he turn in, you know, did he turn into the shell of like, hey, you know what, I'm just trying my best and playoff games are no different than, or was he honest with the playoff Kershaw questions? Yeah, I mean, I think it's something that as you, like the book is not meant to like, absolve or defend him or make excuses or anything like that. And those are certainly not things he's interested in. Um, I think what is interesting is as you chart those seven years, uh, you know, before 2020 of the sort of postseason failures, I mean, I think there's clearly a period uh, at the beginning, you know, specifically kind of facing the Cardinals in 13 and 14, where his stubbornness probably, you know, got the got the better of him, where he was, you know, uh, less willing to sort of adapt at that time. You know, AJ Ellis, you know, talked about how he, uh, he himself still feels a lot of regret for some of the, you know, call pitch calling in, in some of those games. And so, you know, Kershaw was open about his stubbornness about that. And then I think as you get further along down the line, like he was pretty good in 2015, 2016, he's coming back from a major back injury, pitching on short rest, you know, pitching in relief on one day of rest. And then he finally sort of conks out, you know, against the Cubs in game six after pitching a gem in game two. In 2017, we all know what happened there with the Astros. That's the one that, you know, causes him still the most sort of frustration, I think. And then when you get to 18 and 19, he was at a point physically where he just – it, it wasn't like a you know playoff Kershaw issue there. I think it was just a Kershaw's body wasn't working. He was effectively like a one pitch pitcher at that point with the way that his fastball and slider had sort of lacked differentiation. And so he was pretty open um, about you know some of the mistakes in the beginning or you know things he might have done differently in the beginning. But I was more interested in just kind of like what does it feel like to go through that? You know how do you sort of keep coming back? How do you sort of keep subjecting yourself to uh, this trauma, for lack of a better you know term, and I think it's part of the reason why he means so much to so many people, both fans and teammates, and you know people on other teams, is that he's always been willing to you know sort of be the man in the arena and you know go back out there. First of all, yes, our fourteen team, we 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 whooped them twice. I'm just saying, but so, but uh, <laughs> you know, I had nothing to do with this. <laughs> No, not at all. Not that I know of. I, okay. Nobody talked about it. He just hung a curveball right. to Big City and he smashed it. And all the Dodgers, the, yeah, the Dodgers are all like, "Oh, he was tipping." And I talked to I talked to Matt Carpenter, John Jay, Matt Adams, John Mabry, and they all said no tipping. So no tipping. You're no, here to say no. definitively no tipping. No, nobody told me there was he was tipping. We just I don't know why. <laughs> the Cardinals just could hit him. Like game one, he had a big lead. Remember, and, they, and I thought that they yes. left him in too long. And they should have went to the bullpen, and we came yeah. back and won game one. And then game yeah. game four when Matt Adams hit the home run, I mean, he just talking right. curveball to him. But the thing to and me he, is, sorry, go for it. no, go ahead. I was just gonna say he hasn't been. Listen, everyone says playoff Kershaw. I mean, he's thirteen and thirteen with a four for four ERA. 
he's had some rough starts, but he's also had a lot of good starts. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. People only remember like a couple bad starts, but he's actually had a lot of good starts. So I'm, I'm tired of hearing about, you know, oh, playoff Kershaw. You know, you take out, you can do this with anybody, I guess, take out a couple bad starts. I mean, it was playoff Verlander for a while too, let's not forget, right? World Series Verlander, and then he won one. Kershaw's won a World Series. Granted, it was, you know, people then will say, oh, it's 2020. <laughs> Whatever. They won one, okay? He's got a ring on his finger, as yep. he should. He's first ballot Hall of Famer. Kratz took my question about playoff Kershaw, but I have two other questions. One, when is he going to be back? And then two, what's going to keep the Dodgers broader spit from winning the World Series? What What's the one miss on their team roster that they have? Sure. I just want to say one thing about the postseason, um, Brits, and then I can get into that. If you if you pitch six innings and you give up three runs, you are given you are said that you made a quality start and you have a worse ERA than Kershaw did in the postseason. So it is what it is. That's the standard of being one of the all time greats, is you're just judged differently than everyone else. Um as to his current status, you know, he threw a bullpen yesterday. He's recovering from major shoulder surgery. It's the first operation he's ever had in his career. Um, it's a significant surgery. It's the sort of thing, you know, uh, with Kyle Wright and Brandon Woodruff both kind of had capsule surgery this past winter. Um, they're not pitching this year. Kershaw is hoping to come back in July or August. I think it's going to be, you know, it's a it's a new process for him that he's sort of working his way through. But he's continuing to try and build strength, you know, and hoping to be back by kind of the late summer. Um, it feels dumb to bet against him, but, you know, given his age, given the seriousness of the injury, it's going to be a challenge. But, you know, he's certainly, um, he's up for it. And as for what would stop the Dodgers in the postseason, I mean, I feel like it's just a, it's kind of the same issue with them over the past however many years where it's like, look, they need their best players to play well in the postseason. And look, it helps when you go from a two-headed monster to a three-headed monster and you add Otani, who is like uh, uh, just an absolute freak offensively right now. But the thing that they is going to have to carry them is going to be the top three in that lineup of, you know, Betts, Freeman, and Otani. If all those guys go cold at the wrong time, you can lose to a team like the Diamondbacks. I think that they're – I mean, they look to be a real – juggernaut i know there's some issues with the bullpen right now i tend to think that andrew friedman will figure out his bullpen by the time october rolls around um they don't totally know what their starting pitching hierarchy is going to look like but i think if walker bueller is able to you know find anything resembling who he had been before his you know second tommy john that would be a huge boost Clayton Kershaw is able to come back. You have Clayton Kershaw, which certainly helps your rotation. And, you know, you still got Glasnow, who's been excellent. Yamamoto, you know, it seems to be settling in. I mean, they're they're a really good club. They have to be considered the World Series favorites. But what does that mean in May? Nothing. But, by the way, you would have been savage if you would have said the one thing that would have kept him as play, playoff Kershaw. <laughs> you missed your shot, That's Andy. Not what do you want me to that's say? Not if you would, if you just would have said playoff Kershaw, I probably would have walked off set laughing so hard. I mean, knowing, knowing you didn't mean it, but that you, you answered it perfectly. So thank yeah, you. No problem. He's got that sense of humor, though. Uh, I know, I know. He does. I cannot wait. He's got it. In. I expect an autographed copy of my book of Andy's books. <laughs> AJ this one the... put me to sleep. <laughs> this one put me to sleep. So Andy, I love that book. That one was that one was wonderful. It was it was. Well Don't kiss written. up to crafts. I'm kissing up to Tim if he's still listening. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Tim, Tim's definitely still listening. <laughs> Tim definitely wrote it. I was just there for the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. Well, Andy, thanks for swinging by. I know you're doing a ton of these, you know, hopping on shows. So we appreciate the time. Uh, everyone check out the book wherever you get books. The Last of His Kind, a bio of Clayton Kershaw. It is out now. Uh, thanks, Andy. Appreciate you, man. Good luck with, uh, with the book promo. Thank you so much for having me. Call your local library. Hey, everybody. Be sure to like and subscribe for more content. We're back here every weekday, all year long, so do not miss an episode. The videos are coming in all day. Here's another video you might enjoy. Baseball the way it should be covered.